All right, so this is video 15. It is on the middle section of the apology or of the dialogue that's more accurately called the defense. Um, and this time we're going to be looking at uh, Socrates' origin story and about the dialogue with Miletus. So to review, Socrates began the dialogue by saying that he was going to speak plainly without uh, any fancy tricks. He wasn't going to try and woo you with, uh, with a silver tongue or smooth words. And I gave some reasons why I think that's not accurate. Um, then he talks about the original accusers and the current accusers. So this allows him to reframe the question. Um, and then we get to the origin story, right? Socrates, uh, Socrates tells a story about how he came to be the person we know. Um, it's like a superhero origin story. It gives, it, it gives us a sense of the real essence of the character. Um, and in this case, what, what the story does that's really important is it gives us a sense of what it is Socrates is looking for and finds absent in the other people of Athens. So the story goes that uh, the oracle at Delphi, uh, who speaks for the god Apollo and is supposed to be infallible, declares Socrates to be the wisest man in all of Athens. Socrates decides to challenge the oracle because he says he doesn't know anything. And we saw thematically that Socrates' repeated claims that he doesn't know things is an important theme in what he's doing. Um, so he goes about trying to find someone in Athens who is wiser than he is. And he goes to the politicians first, and it's clear that right away that they don't know anything. Um, so then he goes to the poets and the craftsmen. And these two groups, I had, I had discussion questions in the exercises uh, for you about. Right? And each time I ask the same question, why does Socrates say these people are not wise? And what does this say about wisdom? So we can start with the poets. Socrates goes to the poets and says, well, they really do say some very fine things. Um, however, when he asks them to explain their poetry, they can't do that. They can't um, give an account of what they say. In fact, any random person in the audience is better able to explain the meaning of a poem than the poet. And... Uh, the poet just says, oh, I was inspired by the gods. Well, this idea of poetry being in line with the will of heaven fits very well with the Confucian notion of the Tao. Um, and, you know, Confucius or the Taoists might say that this is, um, this is all you need for wisdom. But this is not what Socrates is looking for. The uh, early Taoist Lao Tzu said that the Tao that can be spoken of is not the true Tao. But that's exactly what Socrates is looking for here. A Tao that can be spoken, an explanation. Just, just explain how things work. So element one that, of, of wisdom that Socrates is looking for, it's a ver it involves a spoken, verbal, linguistic explanation. Then Socrates goes to the craftsmen, and he finds that they're not wise either. Why not? Because they um, know their craft, but they think that that means that they know everything. So you can imagine a blacksmith. Um, he is really good at um, making uh, swords or, or horseshoes or whatever, and therefore thinks he knows how to run a city, but he doesn't. Running a city isn't like being a blacksmith. So um, Socrates finds this really upsetting. It's like you, these people think they know things and they don't. Well, that's just awful. Um, so 
part of so this says a couple things about wisdom for Socrates. One is that it has to be general, right? Socrates is not looking at looking for practical knowledge of particulars. He is looking for something that is uh, that covers everything. Don't just show me an example of a good pot that you have made. Tell me what it means for a pot to be good. Or tell me what it means for anything to be good. What is goodness? An abstract account of the nature of goodness is crucial for Socrates' mission. He's not getting it here. So this leads him to conclude that, in fact, the oracle was right after all. Uh, he is the wisest man in Athens, but that's just because he knows he knows nothing, whereas everyone else thinks they know things and they don't really. So with this, Socrates turns to... Um, the actual charges against him. We've actually been doing a lot of dialogue and, and, and he hasn't even, he's just now finally addressing the charges. Um, and he does this th he, the way that his regular dialogues are written he, as, an in, as a conversation, in this case, a conversation with Miletus, one of his accusers. He starts, and so also uh, this is done in the way the regular dialogues are done in that it is very much uh, of, made of arguments that you can put in standard form. And that's what I'm going to be doing in the remainder of this vi video. So, um, on the charge of um, denying the gods of the city. Um, one thing that happens here is that Socrates asks Miletus if he fails to believe in if the charge is that he doesn't believe in any gods or merely that he believes in the wrong gods. Um, so the charge against him was ambiguous. And Miletus, I think, actually gives uh, the, the wrong answer here. He wants to charge Socrates with not believing in any gods at all. Um, and um, the more you dig into Socrates and Plato, the more it's clear that they... that really what's going on is that they just don't believe the normal things about the gods. They're, they have gods, but they're not regular gods. They're forms. Okay. But in any case, this is how Socrates replies. Miletus says, I believe in spiritual matters. He has to admit that. For instance, uh, Socrates r r says he gets a routine messages from the gods from um, a divine sign. It's kind of like a spidey sense. Um, but you can't believe in spiritual matters without believing in spirits. Therefore, Miletus must concede, I believe in spirits. Notice how this argument is all folk, folk done in terms of what Miletus believes. Um, this is standard, a standard Socratic way to argue. He is directing his arguments at the set of beliefs that his opponent has and is showing them to be inconsistent. Um, very much th these, this kind of argument is uh, ad hominem. It is directed at the person. So this conclusion, Miletus must concede, I believe, in spirits, then becomes the premise for the next argument. You combine that conclusion, that uh, C now becomes P1, uh, and you combine that with P2, the spirits are children of the gods, you can't believe in children without believing in the parents. Therefore, new conclusion, Miletus must concede that I believe in gods. This then gets fed into the next argument. That C becomes a new, a new P1. Miletus must concede that I believe in gods, but he has accused me of not believing in the gods. Miletus doesn't really believe his accusations then. He's... he's, he's uh, lying. He's a hypocrite. Um, he is just throwing charges at me to, to, to hurt me. He's not interested in the truth. So we've got three arguments here that form a chain. And we can actually represent them like this, where uh, the, um, the 
statements that form premises in one argument and conclusion from conclusions for the earlier argument, we can label intermediate conclusions and we'll mark them with a dotted line. So the full chain of arguments looks like this. Melita says, I believe in spiritual matters. You can't believe in spiritual matters without believing in spirits. Therefore, intermediate conclusion one, Miletus must concede that I believe in spirits. Premise three, spirits are children of the gods. Therefore, we get to intermediate conclusion two, Miletus must concede that I believe in, God, in, in gods. But he has accused me of not believing in the gods. Premise, that should be premise four. Um, therefore, Miletus doesn't really believe his accusations. So that's one statement. That's one argument. The next argument is on the charge of corrupting the youth. Here Socrates' argument is interesting because it, it hints at a bunch of things that turn out to be major themes in other dialogues. Um, so I mentioned before that Socrates frequently hints that all virtues boil down to some kind of knowledge or wisdom. Um, so uh, when in Euthyphro, when Euthyphro was hinting that um, piety was knowledge of how to uh, attend to the gods, he was closing in on a Plato uh, on an idea that so Socrates seems to believe in. Uh, another thing that Socrates seems to believe in is that no one intentionally does the wrong thing. If you do it, it must be because you believed it was the right thing to do. So the problem is, again, knowledge. Um, people who do wrong are ultimately ignorant. Their failure is a failure of knowledge. And so again, we see why education is crucial for um, uh, Socrates and Plato as it is for Confucius. Education is what turns us towards the good. In any case, we see this idea here that uh, no one wants what is bad uh, knowingly in, in, in his defense against the charge of corrupting the youth. Because what he says is, wicked people wind up hurting the people around them. But no one wants to be harmed, so no one would intentionally corrupt the people around them. Why would you be... Why would you surround yourself with corrupt people? Corrupt people hurt people. Okay. Um, and then the, this again plays a role as a premise in the next argument. Either I corrupt the youth intentionally or I do so unintentionally. No one corrupts the people around them intentionally. That's what was just shown. But you can't be tried for what you do accidentally. Right? Right? Therefore, I can't be prosecuted on these charges. Therefore, Miletus doesn't really know what he's talking about. So that ends the dialogue portion and um, standard argument form portion of the defense. What comes next is a long discussion of Socrates' attitude towards what he's doing and how he understands his role in the city. And, um, uh, and then, of course, his ultimately, ultimately his sense, sentencing. His, um, so we will get to that in the next video.